My name's uh, Tim. I've got the great privilege of uh, being one of the elders here, serving on the uh, eldership team for New Life Community Church. So we're going to be uh, continuing our um, look through Peter. Come and do what you got to do. Hold the microphone. Speak into the microphone. I'm going to have to work hard to stay in the same place here. So we're going to be uh, continuing our study through First Peter, um, and I'm going to read that passage in a minute. But I, I want us first just to uh, just to pray together as we come to the Word of God. Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you are the Spirit of Truth. Thank you that you take these scriptures and impart life to us and i pray this morning that as we just still our hearts and just come before you that you would open the word of god to us just reveal the lord jesus to us reveal truth and implant that truth into our very inner beings into our the very core of ourselves i pray thank you that you're with us Thank you that you're encouraging us. Thank you that you're, you're fellowshipping with us as we fellowship in the word this morning. Amen. Okay. So let me just read the, the passage. So we're in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and we're looking at verses 17 through to 21. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were redeemed, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, which you inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last days for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So we're in the middle of this passage talking about holiness if you remember just the verse before is be holy because i am holy and so we're talking about holiness and we're just about to talk about god as judge but there right in the middle is this passage which says call on him as father and i really just want to present that um, balance to you um, that on the one hand, you know, there is the awesomeness of God. There's the sovereignty of God. There's the holiness of God. There's this sense of, uh, you know, us as fallen, created beings shrinking away um, and never being able to stand in his presence. And yet, in the midst of this, it says, call on him as father. And I just, again, I just want to say, you know, since the Son of God has appeared, the fatherhood of God is revealed and is accessible to us. That's what Jesus taught, isn't it? He said, when you pray, pray like this, our Father who is in heaven, our Father. He teaches us and leads us to approach this sovereign, holy majestic fearful god as father and i just want to say whatever happens wherever you're at if you feel like you've utterly messed up on all this holiness still call on him as father that is the place to start if you if you're on your knees sometimes you know at the foot of your bed or head buried in the settee or wherever it is and you just think, I don't know how to begin. Where can I start? I'm in such a mess. Everything's wrong. Start there. Start there. Start with fatherhood. 
And if you don't get beyond that, you will do well just to start with fatherhood. And let me say, all of us have earthly fathers that are imperfect and that have messed up one way or the other. So all of us have got fatherhood issues. Let's, you know, move on from those. If it's difficult for you to see God as father, then work it through. Work it through. Press on with that because that's absolutely foundational. Call on him as father. So that's where we're beginning. So God is also judge. In, uh, if you track through kind of the revelation of God in, in scripture, obviously we begin with God revealed as creator. But we don't have to go very far before he's also revealed as judge. And there's a direct connection between that. I, I often feel sometimes that when, um, you know, when people reject creation, it, it, it's, it's what, what, what is the big, what's the bigger driver under that is that if there is a creator, then there is now someone to be accountable to. There's a line of accountability. There is judgment. If there's no creator, if we, if, we, if we take on a kind of nebulous idea that we all just come about by accident, there's no line of accountability, so guess what? You can do whatever you want. <laughs> um, but as soon as you introduce the concept of creator, then the concept of judge comes and accountability comes. And it's Abraham who um, says way back in Genesis uh, 18, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. He sees God as judge, he knows God as judge of all the earth. And we should as well, we should understand that, that there is a judgment to come. And so, so we get this next section here where it says, pass the time of your sojourning in fear, or live as strangers. This word sojourner, you know, it's an old English word, so a lot of the modern translations, we, we have stranger, strangers and aliens. I like as a science fiction uh, buff, I like the idea that we are the aliens. <laughs> the scripture tells us I'm the alien. So live as a stranger and an alien during the time of your stay on earth. The whole thrust really right the way through peter he really pushes he very you know he starts right from the beginning and introduces he's right he's writing to strangers peter an apostle of jesus christ to those who are strangers aliens living in scattered about so and and he picks it up again and again we won't go into it all but the end of chapter two and beginning of chapter four he uses that phrase strangers and aliens live as strangers and aliens we are the travelers okay we're the traveling community we're passing through do you think of yourself as that way are you aware of being detached from the world do you have that sense sometimes that I don't belong? These are not my people. Do people approach you that way? I mean, maybe they don't use the words, but perhaps they look at you and think, yeah, you're not from round here, are you? You speak differently. Perhaps because of an absence of swearing and cursing seems to come so naturally to so many these days. I remember reading your article on it. Why do people swear? <laughs> Comes so naturally. And yet for us, that's something I, I've certainly found in my workplace, that's something that people have found distinctive. They notice it. I'm not trying anything, you know, but they're just, he never swears. We're different. We speak different. We talk about different things. We have different priorities. We have a different agenda. One of these passages in Peter says that they think it's strange that you don't run with them into a flood of orgies and drunkenness and what have you. They think it's strange because that's, that's what they think is natural. That's what they do. And, and the fact that you don't join them because you're detached, you're a bit different, you stand out. So, so you, should, you should experience that and you should, be, you should understand I'm experiencing that sense of detachment, that sense of being different um, because I am, because I'm set apart, because I'm 
holy because I'm on a different agenda. I'm heading for a different destination. I'm called for a different thing. So let me just challenge you with that. Are you living that way? Or are you wanting to be too connected? Maybe even as we speak now, let the Spirit maybe convict you where you're too involved, where you're too tied up, ensnared even a little. Let's be free. Let's be free to walk on. Let's be free to be travellers passing through. This is just your, your time passing through. You have a future you have a hope and a destiny. You should find, you know, you might not be able to articulate it, but you should, you should feel the witness of the Spirit in you that you have a hope and a future, you know, that is beyond this place, that is beyond death. You know, people that don't know God don't have that. They only have this life. And that obviously causes great anxiety because things are, you know, very, you know, very unstable, aren't they? Very um, insubstantial. So people who don't know God live with a lot of insecurity and worry. But we don't have those fears of, you know, what's going to become. We know what's going to become of us. We might not know what's in the journey in the next, you know, in in the rest of the journey down here. But we know where we're going. We know where we belong. We know we have a future. And that that future is secure for us and held in heaven and kept in heaven we know those things and you know can you feel can you feel the spirit testify to you confirm inside of you yes that's true do you feel that that's the holy spirit whose very presence in you is evidence that you are secured for that future so live that way as strangers and aliens you're passing through things can be interesting yeah we can enjoy a bit of this we can enjoy but None of it's going to hold us down because we're moving on. We're moving on all the time. And we should be free to move on. So if God calls us on to something else, it should be easy to move. It should be easy to go. Now, knowing here, it says, knowing that you are redeemed. Do you know that? Do you know that you've been ransomed? Do you know that you've been redeemed? Do you know that you've, you've been bought with a price? That's what it says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, where Paul is encouraging us not to go with prostitutes. He says, because you've been bought with a price, you're not your own. Glorify God in your body. It's that same, you know, these are the things that keep us walking in holiness. You're not your own. You've been redeemed. You've been purchased. You've been ransomed. Do you know that? Do you think of yourself as that way? Actually, I'm not just this independent guy who's, you know, oh, I think I'll try a bit of Christianity, see if that helps me. No, you've been ransomed. You've been purchased. A big price has been paid for you. What have you been ransomed from? It says here you've been ransomed from an empty life that was futile and purposeless that, that you've inherited from your forefathers. We tend to think of an inheritance, don't we? Oh, I've, I've received an inheritance. Yeah, that inheritance is nothing. It's empty. It's futile. Nihilistic. It counts for nothing. That way of life. And of course, we mentioned it to begin with, didn't we? If you're going to say there's no creator and we're all here by chance, (laughs) then there's just no foundation, is there? You've got to make your own way and you've got to hope it works for yourself and all you're doing is living till death and then that's it. And you never counted for anything in the first place and you don't count for anything now. That's empty. And I want to say if you're listening to this and you are living an empty life, Maybe it's never been said to you before, but just think about it. Are you living in emptiness? Vanity, just going from one good time to the next, trying to fill this hole inside of you with whatever can be the next best thing. And just moving on and finding that lack of satisfaction and that lack of worth, trying to 
find some self-worth in a, in a worthless and empty existence. It doesn't have to be like that. You weren't made like that. You can be redeemed from that. The price has already been paid for you to be redeemed from that. So don't live that way. Don't live empty and purposeless. That wasn't what you were made for. It wasn't what you were created for. But you were created to live a life of purpose and meaning of worth, growing good fruits, doing good stuff, making a difference in the world, walking hand in hand with your creator. It says here that you were redeemed not with gold and silver, which is corruptible. I, I thought that was a bit remarkable because one of the things about gold, you know, as a chemist, I can tell you gold is remarkably unreactive. Very difficult for gold to react with anything. It doesn't tarnish because it doesn't react with oxygen. It doesn't rust, won't react with, with water. Very few acids or alkalis have any impact on it at all. One of the few things it will react with is mercury. It'll dissolve into mercury and dissolve out again. One of those weird things about mercury. But gold really lasts. I mean, you know, the archaeologists love it when there's gold in it as grave goods because although everything else has long gone, thousands of years ago, the gold that was part of any jewellery just remains exactly as it is. And you've only got to wash the dirt off and it's there and it shines just as much as it did on the day that it was dug out of the earth. But ultimately, like everything, gold is part of this material world, gold is part of this earth, it's all going to be swept away. But the blood of Jesus is eternal. Gold and silver and everything else is just part of this material order, which we know is going to come to an end and be renewed. But the blood of Jesus is eternal. Have you thought about that? That even in the next life, that blood is still effective for you. It's that blood that secured your salvation. It's that blood that was shed for you. And if you think about, think about what, could, what could I give? Say, say Dale needs to be ransomed. I mean, I've got some money. I've got some money in the bank. I could probably scrape together, you know, a few thousand maybe and pay that. If it got desperate, I could start selling things. Don't know what the smart car would sell for. Not very much, really. <laughs> wouldn't, get you out of, wouldn't get you out of jail, would it? Um, but maybe my house, my house is probably the biggest possession I've got. We could maybe sell the house. You know, that might raise a few hundred thousand. I could maybe get that far. But after that, you know, ultimately, I, I'm, I'm the, the most I can pay, isn't it? Ultimately, as much as I can offer is, well, take me instead of Dale. Ultimately, the most I can offer is my life, isn't it? And, and in fact, thinking about it the other way around, that's, that's the ultimate that somebody can take from me. They can take my possessions. They can take my smart car. They could take my house. In the end, the most they can take from me is my life. That's, that's the most I can give. That's the most that can be taken. And I suppose you could start valuing lives and you could say, well, maybe, you know, um, a celebrity or maybe a king or a prime minister you know, their life would be perhaps valued more. A head of state, maybe you'd say, you know, if you're going to kidnap somebody, you could probably charge a higher ransom. You know the phrase, a king's ransom, don't you? Well, that was for good old Richard the Lionheart. The nation was taxed sorely to raise a king's ransom to get Richard the Lionheart back from the Crusades. So that's a king's ransom. That's a whole nation's money. But after that, you know, when you think about it, the highest life has to be Jesus, doesn't it? God himself, the immortal, the ever-living one, comes and dies for you. That's the ultimate life. That's the highest price that could possibly be paid in the whole of everything, isn't it? <laughs> And that was the price that was paid for you. That's what you're worth to your Heavenly Father. He'd pay 
that much. He has paid that much for you. So that's what you're worth. That's what it's all about. And also, that's what everybody else is worth. So when it comes to issues of equality, equal value, every other person you know and meet is worth that price. We don't bring everybody down to the lowest. God brings everybody up to the highest. That's the ultimate price. That's what you're worth. Are you thinking about that? Do you think of yourself that way? The precious blood of Christ. How are we doing for time? Yeah. Right. Foreknown before the foundation of the world. The Bible teaches us that before this whole project began, before you get to Genesis 1, whilst Adam was still a twinkle in God's eye, <laughs> the Trinity had an agreement between them. And the Son was going to underwrite. The Son has decided, the Son underwrote this whole humanity project with his life, with his blood. He said, I tell you, we'll do this, but if it all goes sideways, I'll bail everything out with my life. Well, I want to tell you, it's all gone sideways. It really has all gone sideways. Just look around. And so right from the beginning, right from before everything began, that's where the Trinity were at. And the Son of God already had his life on the line. And it says that he has been revealed in these last days for you. Well, of course, it is the last days because he's been revealed. All right, we're now in the last days because Christ has come. Not because it's now 2000 something. You know, the last days are that period between Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming. That's the last of the last days. <laughs> but the first of the last days is when he came. So we're in the last days. He appeared and he's appeared for you. I like that. It's like, I'm here for you. How about that? I want to just finish here really by just talking about the reciprocity of the cross. Reciprocity is an exchange of opposites. Okay, a reciprocal is an opposite. Three becomes a third, upside down. Reciprocity is an opposite. So you've got an exchange of opposites. You've got an exchange of your darkness for his light. Your death for his life. Your utter bankruptcy before God, having nothing to offer at all with which to redeem yourself, is exchanged for his sonship. That's his standing with God, his sonship. And you can step into that. You share that now. Be a child of God. Call upon him as your father. That's the exchange that takes place. All that is bad, all that is no good, all that is of no merit, for everything in him that is of great merit and infinite worth. And that is the exchange that takes place on the cross. So come to the cross and put everything down. Lay it all down. Don't come, you know, people sometimes think, you know, I've got to come and I've got to be somebody. I've got to be good. I've got to try and be good. I've got to try and get it. Let's see if I can get a week's goodness before I come to God. <laughs> Just, you know, lay it all, forget it. It doesn't count for anything. When you come to the foot of the cross, it all gets laid down. Everything that's bad, of course, we want to throw at the foot of the cross. But you know what? Everything that we think is good also has to go at the foot of the cross. Let's lay it all down. And when it's all laid down, then you can pick up. Then you can take what Christ offers. 
Now, if that's your situation, I want you, I want you to know that offer is available all of the time, 24 7 365 even on a leap year it's available 29th of feb you can still 366 you can cash in it's always available to you all you've got to do is lay yourself down all you've got to do is come to the end of your tether <laughs> which isn't too difficult sometimes is it and put it all down and take up what's offered to you on the cross